The next person I hear singing the praises of so-called elevated horror movies will find themselves elevated into a ceiling fan, much like might happen in a non-elevated horror movie. Uh, this is not aggression apropos of nothing. This is a bit of a teaser for my soon-to-come YouTube movie channel, which I was so pleased to hear that so many of my kind viewers would be interested in. Or, you know, listeners. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Uh, and it's also tangentially related to this video because this video is a subject I also uh, have great wrath towards. <laughs> Uh, so originally, this video was going to be about Gen 5 OU, and, uh, well, it still mostly will be, but it's going to touch on a greater subject within the competitive Pokemon world. So, I got the idea when, uh, during this most recent Smogun Premier League, some of the most die-hard uh, Gen 5 OU truthers... Uh, they saw the light, and they were, and while playing it in SPL and preparing for it and all that, then they suddenly were like, "Wait a second, this tier sucks!" And I always feel a great rush of validation whenever that happens, because uh, it's these same people who are calling me crazy. And uh, yeah, so the basic idea is, and if you go back about a year on my channel, then you'll see the, well. The whole uh, gems thing and why the tier is a mess in general. But shocker, the fundamental issue of the tier has not changed. That being that hyper offense is good into sand and sand is good into rain and rain is good into hyper offense. And it's a triangle of sadness. Hey, movie reference. Uh, in terms of each of these styles being too strong into each other. Not to say they're automatic by any means, but uh, it's too much of an advantage, uh, put it this way. And what particularly uh, got my interest was when Pang was telling me about how hyper-offense teams were dominating Sand so thoroughly that their only losses... Uh, were like literal last turn crits. So uh, at first I was going to go through all the hyper offense versus uh, sand games. And then I realized after a while, you know, you get the point. Because uh, first we're going to get into the general point, the foundation of the tier and why this dynamic is the way it is. And then we will tie it into why it seems to be at this standstill. Uh, so, and there's some great life lessons you can take from this, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Also, funnily enough, uh, these same weatherless hyper-offense teams get utterly clobbered by rain. Uh, <laughs> shocker. Both offensive and defensive. And if you want to see these replays for yourself at your own leisure, uh, I will pause this replay really quick. And I am drawing them from this thread on the Smogun forums. And if you don't know much about the Smogun forums, here is what you do. You go to your browser. You type smogun.com slash forums slash. The slash comes at the end after forums. It's important. Then you'll go to the home page. And then you go to competitive play. And actually you can go right to, you can just control F, Smogun Premier League. And this thread uh, is on the first page, and then you scroll down, go to Black and White OU, and all these games are here. That's where they're from. So you can go through all the games where Hyper Offense gets its clock cleaned by rain, and yeah. Anyway, uh, so to conclude on uh, this wonderful little matchup, and then what happens here is, before we get into the foundation of the tier, just because this is something you might not understand where the hacks is until uh, without context, so here we have Reuniclus, and uh, as long as it gets Chomp into Zam range, then Chomp, then uh, Sensei Axu wins, right? HP Ice, no Yachi, crit Oko. HP Ice does not crit, uh, KO without a crit, obviously. But then you realize that uh, Soul Gazer, it was Salak, as you see here. Show set shows that he was, in fact, Salak. And so he would have KO'd the Reuniclus at plus two, and then outsped and destroyed the Zam. So. Uh, and if you pay attention to this replay at all, then you see the basic theme of why this matchup dynamic is the way it is. 
so the crux of it, as I realized while thinking about it for like two seconds, is that Tyranitar kind of sucks in Gen 5. It's not a good Pokemon in and of itself. It pretty much just gets used because A, sand cuts off rain, and B, it's one of the few things that doesn't collapse uh, against Latios. And if you want an example of uh, the latter in particular, then you can watch any Hippo Sand Team just completely get destroyed by Latios. Hi Hippo Sand Team without T-Tar, obviously. Uh, so, T-Tar is almost completely worthless against Hyper Offense stuff. The most it can do is stay at super high health and uh, live a plus one bug buzz from Volcarona, and even that can be dicey very, very easily. But other than that, it's just a wasted slot, and the number of threats that these hyper offense teams are throwing at you means that if you have more or less a wasted slot against them, then it's much easier for them to clean you up with their other threats. Uh, so, Titar basically sucks against these weatherless teams, and the weatherless teams have a lot more freedom in, against sand because they can just pile up on wall breakers and they are not by not concerning themselves with the rain matchup then they have a lot more freedom in dissecting sand makes sense but then of course they face rain and they are just completely clobbered so uh <laughs> it's a very it's what happens when the dominant forces in the tier are this polarizing and uh, demand such different specific answers. There are very few of them. Another thought I was having was that Cloyster might just be stupid even without gems. Uh, like, the overwhelming sentiment last year was that the matchup triangle of Sand versus Weatherless is not as extreme if the Weatherless team doesn't have gems to further punch through the uh, Sand team's defenses. Like, uh, Volcarona can no longer drop T-Tar, Dragonite can no longer insta-drop Lando T with uh, Dragon Gem Outrage, stuff like that. You know, Cloyster can't do stupid things like Oko Magnezone with Ice Gem, Icicle Spear. Turns out, uh, while it certainly helps, these threats are still very, very powerful, uh, especially with their boosting options, and playing around them is not great, uh, because, especially because, like, Never Melt Ice Cloister still hits incredibly hard. Uh, or, you know, Volcarona of all sorts is still an incredibly polarizing Pokemon. And uh, the way that Sand Teams are constructed, then they tend to not be very good in terms of ice resists. And, um, which also makes them, you know, vulnerable to things like Mamoswine, which is why Mamoswine is so popular on Rain. But uh, Mamoswine doesn't have the cloister ability of outspeeding and suddenly destroying your entire team. So, uh, yeah, it's a matter of shell smash, cloister, wherever you want to pin the blame. Uh, it's a matter, and not just cloister, obviously, because the rapid fire pace these teams allow themselves to play at by deciding to, you know, kind of wing it in the rain matchup gives them a lot of of uh, ability to run over sand teams because sand teams are built around the idea that you can slow down rain if you cut off if you cut their weather off and but they don't play at the same hyper fast pace because tyranitar is not a pokemon you know forget uh, forget hip out on you know in this case tyranitar is not a pokemon in gen 5 ou that you can play at a super fast pace with at least, you know, not in any meaningful sense in terms of dealing with rain. Scarf Tar, you can, to some extent. But then you're a T-Tar that can't check Alakazam. So, or, you know, Reuniclus. So, uh, it kind of defeats the point. And then you are very... Again, it all comes back to the idea of your options for dealing with these things being limited because let's say that you do have that scarf tar well you pair it with something that answers alakazam right well sure uh but then you are still worse against alakazam because alakazam has very few good answers so uh yeah we another thing is that a lot of and, and this ties into the greater theme we get the basic idea of why the tearing or not the tearing well, it is the tiering thing in the sense that it's not really being addressed in, uh, on a tiering scale, 
but the dynamic of the metagame is as it is because a lot of the player base is kind of comfortable with it. And I don't know if this is just because they're used to it or because they like not, you know, being able to potentially beat anyone because they were, you know, regardless of skill level. I, I, I don't know, because the idea to me of, you know, something being so powerful that you pretty much have to pray you won't face it depending on what you're facing, that's generally not a good sign, because that takes player interaction out of the game, and all these other things I've harped on a million times. But this is what this video is about in general, because you don't just see it in Gen 5 OU, you kind of see it in a lot of uh, discourse around competitive Pokemon. And I hope this doesn't mess with the screen, because I'm about to open Discord, which you can't see because... Oh, yeah, it, it kind of messes with the replay screen. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, okay, so I will just skim this on Discord real quick. Yeah, so uh, this was uh, the things that the origin At the beginning of the video, I mentioned how the black and white truthers kind of came around. In, uh, in some of them, anyway, in this SPL, kind of came around to the idea that, hey, it's actually really unpleasant when you've got this uh, very matchup heavy dynamic and you're trying to prepare and because a lot of the time then what's, what's the easiest way to just kind of swat away this argument it's something you'll see in any given competitive Pokemon debate you saw it when Genesect was OU uh, you know every time Genesect was OU you saw it when Mega Rayquaza was in Ubers you know there's nothing too broken for someone to say oh just get good you know, just play around it. Just deal with it. You need to just be better. It's a very... It's a complete non-argument in and of itself because it doesn't engage with the specifics of the um, of the problem. And see, this is why I like to say that competitive Pokemon teaches life lessons because that, you know, if uh, just based on that description, that could apply to a lot of uh, important real-world things. Uh, so, yeah, just, just, just get better. Just get, you know, and it completely fails to recognize, let alone address, the problematic aspects of whatever it is you're dealing with. So, uh, people will say, and the idea of people saying things that are, you know, untrue or hypocritical or inconsistent, you know, is not new. To com it's, you know, almost intrinsic to uh, the competitive... Why is the music not playing? It's almost intrinsic to the competitive Pokemon discourse uh, experience. You know, someone saying something that's just flat out wrong <laughs> and just not even acknowledging that it's... Uh, that it's correct or not. Oh, we got a double uh, Lottie matchup. Double, double Lottie matchup. That's funny. Um, yeah, so I, I was a... Uh, I was an observer from afar for a lot of this discourse, but it was, um, you know, a lot of people saying things like, oh, so-and-so style of team is bad, and then bringing that style of team themselves, or saying so-and-so style of team is bad, and then praising it when used by someone else, and it's very result-oriented, and result-oriented styles of thinking are very you know, not good in a uh, game like Pokemon, like... You could have an insanely broken Pokemon in the hands of someone who would just throw away the game. And then you'd be like, well, the Pokemon didn't, you know, win the game for this far worse player who choked nonstop. So clearly the Pokemon is not broken. You know, um, so there were lots of uh, this kind of acceptance of the tier being heavily matchup reliant. In this, and a lot of the prep work being super heavy guesswork. Uh, and this is much more impactful in a tier like Gen 5, because in a lot of other generations, you can sort of sidestep the hardcore prep stuff. Um, not, not to say that you shouldn't prep, or that you can prep, or anything like that. That is not what I'm saying. Uh... It's more that as long as you're aware of your own general tendencies, then you can realistically take on a lot of what the metagame is going to throw at you. That's a healthy dynamic, right? But in Gen 5, 
then the you know everyone knows what the options are it's the big three the hyper offense the sand the weatherless or uh, sorry the uh, hyper offense which is the weatherless the sand and the rain and it's very much guesswork in terms of um, what the opponent is going to bring, and if you get it wrong, then it's not, oh, well, it's not what I expected, but I can play around it. You know, your options for, uh, quote-unquote, playing around it are much more limited. And, you know, these replays uh, from SPL, again, I invite anyone watching to go through the replays and see these, uh, uh, see these dynamics in the tier for themselves. So... Um, yeah, so in any other tier, like Advance, for example, you know, someone could spam a lot of Skarmory, Titar, Blissey, Gengar, Swampert, Filler kind of stuff, right? And someone could take advantage of that, for sure, but if the Skarm, Gengar, Titar, whatever player was aware of, you know, the kind of patterns they fall into, then they could realistically, you know, still stick to their guns, I mean, you know, not blindly and not completely identical every single time, but they can stick to their guns reasonably and still play and, and still generally bring that style because that style is good because it handles so much of the metagame, whereas the styles in Gen 5 are really not good against the entire metagame. They're good against a certain portion of the metagame, and as soon as you face that portion of the metagame that you aren't able to handle, which tends to happen, then your options for playing around it are much, much more limited, just because the options for dealing with it are not as good. So, as soon as, soon as you don't have... Because, again, and I would welcome someone to try and, you know, make a styles of team that can consistently be brought, because what you were seeing in this uh, video in particular is the drawback of sand um you know in terms of like all these sand teams are just fine in terrain well most of them anyway but and when it comes to teams that uh say forget that rain thing because it loses to sand so i'm going to just uh, go all in on beating these consistent sand teams then it's something else entirely and then of course when the rain teams run into sand then we already know what happens there yeah, uh, so, oh uh, yeah, so the point I was making, and something that was, uh, kind of, I, I don't know what the source of comfort is, I would love to hear from the, uh, both sides of the black and white debate on, uh, on the subject, because I'd like to hear the players who say, yeah, this is why I don't like it. And also the players who are fine with the matchup dance. Because I, personally, I cannot wrap my head around it. I don't get it. The whole, yeah, I'm fine with there being a lot of variants. I'm fine with their, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, the game. Like, there's, knowing that you're not going to win all the time, even if you do most things right. Because Pokemon is the way it is, you know, in terms of RNG and matchup itself. And then there's it to this extent in black and white um as a uh, sorry i'm gonna pause this just so i don't ruin the screen by uh, switching to yeah okay so a lot of the uh prep work in gen 5 in particular was is you know completely nonsensical like um someone there, here's an example someone has like 50 percent keldeo usage and you know and then someone will feel completely comfortable loading a hyper offense team 6 would by Keldeo into a player who uses that and then the player happens to not bring Keldeo there and uh, then you wind up looking stupid when if you had just stuck to your guns and that's the whole idea of why it's such guesswork and why it's a problem that this guesswork is so intrinsic to the tier in a way that it isn't in other metagames I don't think like if uh, we're talking something like Oris I don't think that it's nearly as extreme. I think that tier is a much better options for dealing with the uh, power level of the metagame, much more so than Gen 5. Uh, so, I mean, even, you know, this, which uh, Dark Eveon's team is very unconventional here, and it's just, you know, Cloister City, if I recall. Um, yeah, so a lot of that whole prep thing, like, oh yeah, I read my opponent's soul. Yeah, totally. 
uh, is very inconsistent. And I actually have to make a video on that kind of thing in general. But uh, it's it's weird because like you'll never hear them talking about the you know the times where they didn't read their opponent's soul. But that one time it worked. Oh yeah, it was all them. Yeah. So so it's clearly the method that's working there. You know. Uh, because it works that one time and then doesn't several other times. Especially because, like, here's the easiest example in the world. Um, if your opponent always brings, I don't know, let's say, Thunderous Rain, right? L like, to go back to that Hyper Offense 6 by Keldeo example, this is another version of that. Your opponent always brings Thunderous Rain. And, and in this, you know, prep-heavy black-and-white environment, you would see an equal argument, depending on who you ask, uh, of, oh, they always bring thunderous rain, so I'm going to prepare for it hardcore to shut it down. And at the same time, you would see that exact same logic used to justify the opposite uh, approach, which would be, Oh, they always use thunderous rain. Therefore, I will use something six owed by thunderous rain to catch them off guard because they're not going to bring it because it's too obvious. And the, you cannot know for certain. Either way, you cannot know. So the solution in that case would be bring something that can handle a little bit of everything and let you play the game, right? Well, and that's where we circle back to the problem of not really having the tools for that to be an option in gen 5 so um yeah so uh, this player mentality thing is uh like the, that prep example like you'll see that thrown around in lots of different tiers you know people's willingness to be 6-0'd by a certain threat for a potentially insignificant uh, matchup advantage you know that they uh, it, which, uh, but and the difference being in black and white that it is unavoidable to some extent, uh, and the problem is that no one, I mean, the people who think there is a problem, it's tough to locate where exactly the problem comes from. I still think it's rain personally, uh, and you know, because if there's no rain, then you don't have to use you know terrible T-tar. Uh, you know, as much. I mean, they're still like the psychics, but as hyper offense has shown us, you can beat them as well as. Or the, is it shell smash? I don't know. But uh, then there's people who will. I don't. I've seen a lot of players in. Uh, I don't even know if Watashi's team here qualifies as true hyper offense, but whatever. It's weatherless. Also, uh, TDK forgot to make the scarf scissor fast enough to outspeed Alakazam, which is hilarious and uh, actually game changing. But it, it should. That's that was just a mistake. Keep that in mind if you're paying attention to this. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I've, I've seen the opinions from uh, the player base just, like, change on such a dime, like, oh, yeah, we need to ban this thing and this thing and this thing, to then, like, a day later, oh, no, the tier is perfect, don't mess with it. So it's all, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of messed up. And actually, uh, here's, uh, something else I wanted to mention. This kind of thinking extends not just to metagame calls of, you know, let's run a team 6 0 by so-and-so because it'll get us a better matchup against, you know, that other team style. It also goes to things like, uh, team tournaments thing. I'm not going to turn this into a soapbox about best of three in team tournaments and how much better it is because that's a whole different video. But, you know, th those arguments are exhausting and infuriating. Um, yeah, but what's, and I, I promise I'm not trying to, uh, single out Finch here as, uh, to, you know, castigate him for this awful opinion of his. It's an opinion I disagree with, for sure, but it's not meant as a hit piece on Finch in particular, um, because I like Finch, even though I know that popular Pokemon wisdom on the internet tells me I shouldn't for some reason. Uh, don't worry, I, I plan to make a video called Why Finchinator is Evil, and hopefully catch, uh, catch a lot of viewers from all the people who are eager to tune in and hear about how he should be sent to hell for defending the Smogan stall status quo. Get excited for that. Uh, yeah, but uh, this sentence in particular, the element of single team prep is an important part of da 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 Okay, cool. But then this sentence, which I find completely antithetical to what I thought competitive Pokemon was about, I find variants, while frustrating and less competitive at times, worth embracing rather than minimizing. 
And this I had a really difficult time comprehending because I thought, I, all these years I've been thinking we are trying to make the most competitive experience possible, within reason of course. You know, I, I understand that this is a hobby and not a you know, full-time paid job. So, you know, we can't do, you know, uh, best of five or uh, whatever, you know, one tier best of five, maybe you stretch it out over the course of, to, to an extent I get it, but the whole embrace variance outright thing, that, I, I thought we were supposed to try and minimize it everywhere possible. And uh, Finch is, the reason I especially don't want to single out Finch is because he is not the only one I have seen espouse this viewpoint. Uh, for example, uh, in arguing, I've had this uh, argument in Gen 3 OU in particular, because there are some uh, players who will argue against things that have hardcore variants, like Hypnosis Gengar. Um or against the use of offensive teams, you know, in general, because a lot of their so-called consistency comes from fishing for hacks. Like, uh, T-Tar just needs to get one rock slide flinch, and then it's fine, you know. Uh, or, I mean, one rock slide flinch out of ten attempts or something, you know, that's something completely different. It's one piece of luck in a very short period of time. That's uh, the issue. But... Um, and then the, how this ties into the Finch thing is that the counter argument was, oh, well, uh, I think, or we think, cause it wasn't just one person. We think that there should be more variance in Pokemon because it's boring if the best players or best players just win all the time. Uh, you know, if someone, and that also completely blew my mind because, uh, yeah, and this is uh, when I started descending into the, you know, don't take it so seriously thing, if this is the mentality. Um, but yeah, I, if, and all these kind of mindsets kind of tie together, uh, and it's especially weird for me to think about because of, um, when I, uh, you know, started out in the competitive scene, then this kind of thinking would get you laughed at. And, you know, go back to Cerebi and stuff like that. And uh, now for, like, the... Because these are, like, respected players. These are not, like, you know, random people who hopped off the ladder at 1100 and were like, I think Salamence should be banned because so-and-so. You know? Um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of interesting how competitive Pokemon is kind of circled in that way. Yeah, in that kind of thinking. Um, yeah, so uh, that's basically the the gist of the whole thing that you know maybe and i just feel very out of place in it because if, if this is what the majority of people want then you know, who am i to argue against it you know i thought i guess you just at this point you just kind of accept it's um it's more of a i mean uh, you always know that it is a casual competitive thing overall but before that didn't stop us from trying to make it as competitive as possible and not just openly going, yeah, I don't really care if it's competitive or, you know, or even more so, like, embracing things that create variance. Yes, Pokemon is a game of, um, of dealing with variance. Of course it is. But that, there's a difference between that and, um, and just making the game so variance heavy that the skill winds up being very, uh, you know, having its impact on the winner of a game minimized to a certain extent. I remember I was talking with Blunder a few years ago, and he really wasn't a fan of Gen 7 OU at the time, and I asked him why, and he was like, dude, like, playing the game feels so pointless when at some point Magirna's gonna come in and just blow everything away. And, you know, if you replace Magirna with, you know, uh, whatever RNG aspect, then, uh, you know, RNG in terms of, like, team matchup and stuff, as we see it in black and white, then there's, a uh, you know, I, I get the point. I, I That's what I feel like, because, personally, if I'm playing competitive Pokemon, it's for the competitive, you know, interactions with the other player. And when there's too much of the in-battle, uh, 
interaction when that aspect is minimized obviously the battle b begins before you know you send the challenge of course uh, but when uh, there's there's too much of a certain element of the game that pops up you know whether it's matchup or a, a broken Pokemon you know a warping games around it you know effectively the same thing then it winds up kind of ruining the you know, the purpose. I've already gone over uh, this game on the channel, I did, how to analyze a Pokemon battle list. So if you've seen that, then uh, you know that this game ends in a heartbreaking crit. Uh, in a very well played game. Uh, but if you haven't, then go check it out because it is also uh, widely applicable to being, to uh, playing well. Uh, yeah, so, and so this is the last one. Uh, I, I guess uh, I this kind of turned into an elegy for myself <laughs> unintentionally but like if this is what people want competitive Pokemon to be then sure but we have to be upfront about it and that probably is gonna require a whole um, a whole uh, restructuring of our whole thing if it's because the, the, the whole idea of the consistency of our tiering method before was some semblance of competitiveness because that's the only real attempt at objectivity we have and now the kind of I don't know you know I, I I don't pretend to have all the answers I just you know know that when something's rotten in Denmark and um, and Gen 5 OU feels emblematic of a larger player based mentality kind of thing it's not new no not by any means uh, but you know, and the Gen 5 OU thing is just the most particularly egregious example of it because to me it's just ridiculously blatant and it just uh, keeps happening. Uh, I guess there's a movie analogy to be made, uh, you know, shocker, because uh, I find a lot of the current state of um, IP-based franchise blockbuster you know, stuff, uh, I, I find it to be you know, detestable. Not because I don't like that style of movie, necessarily, but, it, you know, not everything has to be high art or whatever. I don't like the term high art, but that's, you know, something, that's another thing. Not everything has to be, you know, s that style of film, uh, but it does become a problem, for me anyway, when, a, when those kinds of movies are so prominent and so suffocating in terms of the cinematic landscape that they kind of push everything else out and they turn art into a dirty word uh, and you know if you're if you want to keep the competitive Pokemon thing going then you turn competitiveness into a dirty word or whatever yeah and then um, yeah, if, when art gets turned into a dirty word and people just... But when you feed so many people uh, or audiences this kind of mass-produced drivel, uh, then, of course, they're just going to want more and more of it. And, you know, the curiosity for something new or something good is, you know, what they would consider good is something very different. And at, at the end of the day, they're like, we just want everything to be like this we want everything to be superheroes and ips and you know recognizable superstars and you know english language and you know 100 million dollar budgets and all this stuff and everything else is just kind of like no we don't want movies to be like that we want it to be a certain way and anything else just yeah so uh, so to tie it back in competitive pokemon if po people want it to be this way then all right sure um who am I to take that away? Uh, I just had to get this out there and start the conversation because, as I recall, it was not long after last year's video about the mess that is Gen 5 OU that gems were banned, which was absolutely a step in the right direction. Not saying it wasn't. How could you? Um, yeah, hopefully now we will say, you know, this uh, you know, something is uh, not well and uh, something is rotten in Denmark. And we should fix it because Denmark is actually a beautiful country. So, thank you so much for watching slash listening. Uh, I hope this was of interest to you. If you have something to contribute, then please do. Uh, also, I have a Patreon. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Whatever. Uh, I have a Patreon if you want to you know, throw me a couple bucks a month. Or even just one buck a month. It adds up. Thank you kindly. 
Uh, yeah, and either way, I will see you in the next one.